Hello, it's Peter here and it's really good to see you all on YouTube today. I think we've got a brilliant episode for you. It's with one of Britain's leading contemporary writers, Robert Harris, who doesn't really need much of an introduction from me. He's written so many glorious books over the year. Fatherland, Back in the 90s, Pompeii, the Cicero trilogy, An Officer and a Spy, I could go on. He's one of my favourite writers. It was a bit of a pleasure to talk to him. And... Um, we were talking about this new novel of his, which is only just out. It's called Act of Oblivion, and it's set at the time of the English Restoration. So the time when King Charles II came back to regain the throne after the 1650s and the Experimental Republic led by Oliver Cromwell. Fascinating history. It's actually centred on an even greater story, which is the greatest manhunt, people say, in English political history. So I spoke to Robert just the other day, and uh, here's the video of our conversation for you coming in just a second. I began by asking him just what it was that attracted him to the year 1660. Well, if you want to write about a time when um, a political power was um, being struggled over uh, and parceled up and carved up, in the most extraordinary time, then you couldn't pick any anything better uh, than 1660 uh, in English history. Um, it's certainly one of the key dates um, and um, a turning points in uh, our nation's story, and also probably in the history of the world, because we a kind of compromise was struck between Parliament and royalty um, that was the beginnings of the of the modern constitution we have and which arguably um, set the pattern for Britain's um, great growth and power and influence over the um, centuries that followed. Mm. It's often spoken about as a bit of a lacuna in the in the general public knowledge of history, the 17th century, but it was, as you said just then, a time of huge significance. Can you tell us very kind of briskly what happened in the mid 17th century, which maybe bears on the world that we live, we live in today? Yes, I know what you mean. Um, the old joke that history is just either Tudors or Nazis. There does seem to be some um, truth in that. Um, the um, it was a extraordinarily important um, century, the middle part of it certainly, um, in which um, Parliament ch challenged the absolute rule of the king, um, and eventually a combination of um, anger over taxing taxation. Um, and also a demand for the ability to practice religion as you wished led to a, uh, an explosion and uh, a bloody war which went on for, well, really, technically for seven years, but really dragged on after that as well, um, that left tens of thousands of dead and Britain with a huge army for the first time, standing army and a burgeoning navy, um, and uh, we were a republic, astonishingly, for 11 years. In the middle of the 17th century, England was a republic, which you, I think a lot of people don't quite um, grasp how important that was. 150 years before the French cut off the head of their king, 250 years before the Russians got rid of their Tsar, uh, we did it. And um, it was the ushering in of the modern world, not just for us, but for the whole world. And you know, it bears looking at that period. It's difficult in many ways because it's very complicated. Lots of entwined kind of ideas and the religious ideas are ones that are quite difficult for people to come to grips with. But it was an extraordinary time. Yeah, I was um, reading Anna Kay's book, which was it's called The Restless Republic. It's published recently and it just looks at the 1650s as a decade in English history, and you really get a sense of how consequential these years were. There were years of, um, I, th I think, a huge breadth of thought, but then also um, the start of territorial expansion across the globe. So, for example, you find the English turning up in Jamaica in 1655 and so on. So it is really interesting. There's a line actually from that book that I thought I'd quit back to you because it catches something of the flavour of the language of the time. It says, it hath been found by experience that the office of a king in this nation and to have power thereof in any single person is unnecessary. And it's a kind of laconic for the times, I suppose. But the idea of getting rid of a king was really quite something.
Yes, when the uh, when it became clear that it was going to be impossible for the army to compromise with uh, the king, and they'd lost all trust in him, uh, and they moved to put him on trial, a show trial, it must be said, not really anything we would represent recognise as proper procedure. Uh, Cromwell said we should cut off the king's head with the crown upon it. This was the revolutionary step, not just getting rid of this particular monarch because he kept breaking his word and there'd never be peace as long as he left alive, uh, was left alive. They wouldn't even entertain a moderate successor. They were just going to get rid of the whole institution with one fell swoop of the axe. This is a, a staggering thing. Of course, what then followed was the realisation that um, the world wasn't ready, really, and perhaps this country never will be ready for rule by parliamentary, faceless, essentially, parliamentary committees, um, which no one felt any great loyalty towards, and someone had to step in. There had to be some figure that people could, uh, you, you know, look to, even if they didn't like them very much. Nevertheless, you knew uh, there was someone there. And that, of course, was Cromwell, who was in a unique position um, because of his <coughs> military success and the undoubted power of his personality. So we had the kind of military dictator, our Napoleon, if you like, under the protector. But when he died, then the whole thing fell apart again. And it proved that, well, you did need a king. Ideally, though, you needed a king head whose power was hedged in by parliament. And that, that was what, in the end, we ended up with. Yeah, exactly. Now, let's um, get back to the history in a moment. I wanted to ask you a question about writing for a moment, because... I, like many others who are listening to this, I'm sure have enjoyed so many novels from you over the years. And I'm always struck, probably one of the, the qualities of your writing which strikes me the most is your choice of the narrator. And it's a very interesting choice. Usually it's, um, it's a character who has um, incredible access, but might be a little bit um, marginal to the centre of the scene. I'm thinking of, um, of course, is it Tiro or Tyro? I can't remember. Tiro, yeah. Tiro, guess his name in, in the right way, in, um, in the Cicero um, trilogy. This story has different, uh, the story, I should hold the book up so everyone um, can get a sense of it, Act of Oblivion has quite a picaresque um, panoramic quality to it. It's very difficult to find a character who sees everything. How did you um, go about constructing the central narrative um, uh, of the book, if you see what I mean? Well, yes. I mean, I, I came to it through um, hearing this phrase, the greatest manhunt of the 17th century, and I wondered what that was. And then it was the hunt for the regicides, which is a fascinating story, a really modern kind of detective yeah. story with ports closed, letters intercepted, codes broken, um, prisoners interrogated, tricks and traps. And uh, what this manhunt lacked was a manhunter, a central figure, organising. And I thought that that's what I, as a historical writer, a novelist, could provide. Um, so I invented a, the manhunter, Richard Naylor, in my book. And I've read a lot of um, very dusty, dry books about uh, Stuart government and uh, Cromwellian government and located the, in the structure of how the country was run, where this man might slot in, that is working for the regicide subcommittee of the Privy Council, which sounds boring, but what does actually immediately anchor me, you know, because there's no Scotland Yard, there's no FBI, you know, that's where this man would have been, and I, then it becomes procedural. How would he have done it? Who would he have seen? How would he have gone about it? That was the first stage. The second stage then was thinking about the people he was hunting. There were 59 signatures of Charles I's death warrant. There were uh, more than 100 judges. Uh, all of these were automatically wanted men, and um, but I couldn't write about all of them. So I settled on these two remarkably, remarkable couple, really. Uh, a father-in-law and son-in-law, Colonel Edward Whaley and Colonel William Goff, one age 60, one age 40, who went to um, North America, to New England, and were on the run for years. And so um, the relationship between them um, is, is part of the heart of the book, um, the different characters, and they were very different men, and how they survived hiding in barns and cellars, living out rough in the open, encountering Indians, encountering wild animals, 
somehow keeping going. And then this implacable, remorseless figure, Richard Naylor, on their tail. So the book naturally sort of cuts from one side to the other. We begin in New England, then we go to uh, Leicestershire, where Naylor discovers the death warrant hidden in a country house, which is a true story. Then we go back to New England and so on. This cat and mouse um, structure develops. Yeah, um, I think something that you said then probably deserves to be emphasised because it does feel like a very modern story, doesn't it? You have um, a, an international manhunt. This is the um, the business of 20th century fiction, often much more than um, 17th century. So I, I suppose that's an inherent draw towards it. But what I want to do over the next um, part of this conversation is explore a little bit of the historical context to the novel, which you've suggested already, but it really is fascinating. And um, that begins with us going back to the year that you've chosen, 1660, to have a look at things a bit more closely. Um, it's it's a complicated year, 1660. It's a year that John Evelyn simply titles in his journals, Annus Mirabilis, at the top. Um, if you take us back to the start of January in 1660, was there any clarity about what kind of country England was after these, you know, this decade of experimental politics? No, I mean, that was the problem. Cromwell had died in um, 16, in October, um, autumn 1658. 1659 was a year of chaos, really. Uh, there was an attempt to um, maintain the rule, his rule through his son, uh, Richard, but Richard wasn't up to it. Um, there were factions in the army. There was one son of Cromwell's, Henry, who was in control of Ireland. He probably did have the uh, um, character yeah. to um, step into his father's shoes, but um, the army didn't like him. And really, this goes back to the problem, the besetting problem after the victory in the Civil War, that you, really, you had two factions in the army. And... and really summed up um, by my two protagonists. There's the moderate Edward Whaley, who was Cromwell's cousin, the older man who was a political moderate. And then you have the firebrand radical, his son-in-law, Goff, uh, who uh, had visions and um, utterly opposed uh, the king's rule um, and was a moving factor in the Putney debates. Uh, so, you, you know, you've got and completely unstable situation. You've got Cromwell, the, the kind of king as an all but name, removed. Um, you've got a large royalist faction drifting around. You've got a powerful army, which is divided in two. Um, you've got um, all sorts of um, religious kind of um, frictions. You've got the fundamentalist Puritans, fifth monarchists, people who believe Christ's about to come back to earth. It's kind of chaos. And um, at the beginning of 1660, the decisive move is made by General Monk, the parliamentary commander in Scotland, who, astonishingly, from nowhere, really, because no one had thought he was this kind of character, starts to march his army south from um, uh, Scotland to London to restore order. Um, and uh, it was it, at the point at which he made up his mind to make the dramatic gesture, I don't think that we really exactly know, but he made up his mind that the only way to solve all this chaos in the state was to invite the exiled son of Charles I back into the country to, be, to, take, to take up the crown again, but under certain conditions. And so uh, Charles, who thought that it was all over for him, really, and was living a pretty impoverished kind of, you know, rackety existence on the on the continent, suddenly finds himself approached to return. And it's, it's, so it's a, it is an astonishing moment in, in, in political history of drama uh, and of intrigue and of fundamental immense uh, repercussions, because here is the beginning of the modern British state in a, in a deal between Parliament and the King. Uh, and uh, so 1660, which is the year my novel opens, is, is, is one of those pivotal turning points. I mean, a lot of 
years it's often claimed that for, but you really can claim it about 1660. Yeah, there's the old cliche, might is right. Would it be fair to characterise this as a military coup almost? That sounds a bit anachronistic. Um, well, maybe it wasn't, I don't know. But Monk is, is an interesting character. You you describe him as someone who played his cards pretty close to his chest, right? Sand, or maybe just didn't know what he was going to do. Um, is that correct? Is he quite a, I suppose he's, an, he's maybe an an understated character in English history, given the decision he did make. Yes, he is. He is. Um, he wasn't one of the big commanders of the uh, famous commander. He wasn't a Fairfax or yeah. a, let alone a Cromwell. Um, he was uh, uh, a soldier, soldier, a kind of blunt bluff man. Whether it's significant or not, I don't know. His wife was said to be very ambitious. Um, and seems to have kind of gingered him up. Uh, and uh, but and I think that it was a sort of patriotic move, but he found himself in all this chaos with the most powerful instrument in his hands, which was um, a functioning, disciplined army. And although it wasn't huge by the standards of the Civil War, it was enough. Uh, and as he approached uh, London, there was great excitement about his arrival and a great deal of uh, popularity because people felt that something had to be done. And so you, it's not really a military coup. It's a, almost a reverse military coup. It's, it's the army divesting itself of power after um, 11 years rather than uh, the reverse, um, which is what makes this period so fascinating and the deal that Monk struck and the tightrope which he and the incoming royalists walked over the months that followed uh, was remarkable because certainly most people, most a lot of people in the army and certainly the characters, my two Puritan colonels as they were at this time, uh, would have thought that this was just another temporary upheaval um, before eventually the rule of the army and the rule of right as they would have seen it was restored in fact it wasn't but they took up arms against monk and his deal uh and following general lambert who had been imprisoned in the tower and who escaped and tried to raise the last banner of the, the good old cause but failed so this is a kind of civil little mini civil war with uh, 11 years after the civil war um that you see in 1660 as this fight goes on as to whether they are they is, is this guy monk really going to betray the revolution and have the king back it was sort of staggering but yes he was and there was general popular will for it there seems little doubt about that there was great rejoicing and celebration at the prospect of the king coming back Mm, really captured the mood. But one of the lessons of our time is how difficult it is to put failed states back together. And I suppose in a way, in 1660, that's what England was. And it speaks to the, um, I suppose, the skill of the people who were involved, but also to the elements of luck and capturing the emotional mood of the moment, um, which is so important at the time. I wouldn't say it was a failed state, actually. I would say there was a power vacuum after the death of Cromwell, but I think that Cromwell's administration was good and deft, and he had laid the basis for the for the huge for the massive expansion in British power and influence across the globe, with the Western design you referred to earlier in um, in the Caribbean, with the Puritan largely Puritan expansion across New England. Um, and uh, with a powerful navy, uh, you, you uh, and and indeed the 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 removal of the kind of absolutist courtier kind of led system, you had the beginnings of um, of a great power starting to rise. So the state was a lot was implicit in this state. Uh, a lot was about to occur in this state uh, but it needed it needed to sort out the top and that's what happened in 1660. Well I think you've said what I'm going to talk about absolutely perfectly here because we've got our three dates to look at in 1660 the first one of which is the 29th 
of May in 1660, which is the date when Charles II returns to London after being exiled, and he's proclaimed a lawful monarch. Now, I've already mentioned John Evelyn, but he really is the best source for this. There's a wonderful piece in his journals, and he says, This morning came His Majesty Charles II to London after a sad and long exile and calamitous suffering both of the king and church being 17 years this was also his birthday, which adds a bit of extra to it. And with a triumph of about 20,000 horse and foot brandishing their swords and shouting with unexpressible joy, the ways strawed with flowers, the bells ringing, the streets hung with tapestry, fountains running with wine, the mayor, old men and all the companies in, in the liveries, chains of gold, banners, lords, nobles, cloth and silver. I mean, the day after we've had London turned into um, something which approximates to this, it's quite I suppose, an apt time to be thinking back to this day, which is still remembered by some as Oak Apple Day. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Charles II coming back to London? Well, um, first of all, it's utterly unexpected. I don't think Charles himself or anyone in January would have expected what was going to happen in May. Um, uh, I I, I think they'd, they'd all pretty well given up much hope of ever coming back. They had royalist agents. There were obviously royalist sympathisers all over England, but it seemed impossible, even with the chaos of after Cromwell's death, that, that this should suddenly happen. Uh, but Monk, as we were saying, played the decisive role. Um, and a, a kind of feelers were put out and a meeting was arranged and uh, a kind of compromise was hammered out largely the work of the king's chief advisor sir edward hyde who eventually became the earl of clarendon and is again is one of these figures that of course academic historians know about but most general readers of history probably don't know much about i didn't know myself what a crucial role he also played he was in a sense a kind of royalist monk um in that he was himself a moderate um and uh he you know what could have happened was a thirst for vengeance and a kind of you know pouring back and, and mass mass kind of um, repression of of uh, the old puritans and the new model army but they probably weren't powerful enough to undertake that anyway uh and so they came to a kind of deal um which was that um anyone who took up arms against the king would be forgiven, that there would be no retribution for that. Um, the, the modern phrase truth and reconciliation might be applied to the process uh, that Hyde and Monk um, devised, um, with one exception, um, which was anyone who'd had a hand in the execution of the king. Um, they were held to be beyond the pale. Having said that, the understanding was that only perhaps four of the leading regicides, as they called them, would be proceeded against. The rest could surrender, uh, admit their wrong, maybe pay a huge fine or something, uh, and that would be that. Uh, and it was on this basis, with this kind of agreement, um, that they moved forward. In the end, um, they had to insert a clause in this declaration of intent, which was that they would turn it over to Parliament to exactly work out who or how many of these regicides they would go after. But it was sort of buried in a kind of sentence. Uh, and then uh, Charles set out on this extraordinary, improbable uh, return to England. He left Holland. Um, he was met um, on the coast by Monk and the leading parliamentary figures. Um, and it was just um, roses all the way, really, and wine and women, no doubt, knowing uh, Charles. Uh, and they lingered a little so that he could go into London on his, I think, 30th birthday. Um, a man who had fled the country after the Battle of Worcester and had had to hide in a tree and leave in disguise and, and scrape, go around with a 
outstretched begging bowl for money to try and maintain some kind of style in exile, suddenly found himself granted, granted vast estates, money by parliament, and um, back he came, and uh, most improbably. But to huge scenes of celebration, there's no doubt about that, I think. There was a great exhalation of breath and relief and I think a willingness to try and um, make this work. The only ones that didn't were feel this were people like uh, Whaley and Goff, my heroes, the hardcore of the old Cromwellian army who looked on uh, in horror. You know, we'll get to those in just a minute. A question about Charles's personality, though, first, because he's pretty well mythologized today as the Mar Mary Mon Monarch. We you don't have to drive far through um, the English shires to find a Royal Oak pub and so on. Um, tell me a little bit about Charles's character. He, he's known as a gambling man, but what your novel suggests is there was a strong streak of vengeance in him, which may well be logical given what he's experienced. Of course, you open the book with um, an account of his father's execution, which which um, which, which does explain things. But um, how, what kind of sense did you get of of Charles the Second? I should say this: we've got Charles the uh, the Third today, so we should talk about his immediate predecessor on um, the first opportunity, if we can. Well, he, he's a curious figure. I mean, he's a sort of, in some ways, he's a pretty worthless figure. Um, and a lot of people who worked with him and knew him thought that he was pretty lazy. He was utterly self indulgent, particularly with women. Um, he um, seems to have been sexually voracious and. Um, it became notorious, actually, and then eventually a source of great friction between him and Clarendon, the way that the court carried on, and um, he habitually poured P-A-W-E-D, women who came into his presence. Um, uh, and there was an element of vengeance about him, of course, um, you would expect that, but I don't think he was a particularly cruel or vengeful man. Um, he watched, it seems, according to Evelyn, to have watched one of the executions, the hanging drawings and quarterings from the Holbein Bridge, looking north towards Charing Cross, across Whitehall, to have watched it from there. But um, I think that generally he was sort of, he wasn't in the forefront of, of calling for more and more bloodshed. He was probably just too a bit too laid back for that. Um, I think he liked to go off and do his hunting and his whoring and his uh, um, li living a good life in Hampton Court as much as possible. Always short, always begging for more money. He got through an enormous amount of cash. He had endless illegitimate sons, uh, but he couldn't get one that was a legitimate heir. So the uh, line went down through his brother. James and James succeeded him, and then James, oddly enough, had impregnated Clarendon's daughter, uh, and the, the product of their union became eventually Queen Anne. So you know, it's a very, it's a kind of roisterous, kind of mm -hmm. peculiar uh, setup. Um, but I think Charles deserves some credit for his lack of um, vindictiveness for being generally just a kind of lazy figurehead, except at the time of the um, Great Fire of London in 1666, where he was where he was a great rallying figurehead, riding out into the, um, you know, the, the wreckage and um, taking charge of the fighting of the fire along with his brother. Um, he died relatively young, and of course he died um, a Catholic. Mm. Um, so um, an extraordinary figure in, in history, not a great man by any means, but not a bad man particularly, and probably we were lucky that we had someone like that at that time to ease our way through into this transition because there was an element of figurehead about him almost naturally, mm -hmm. uh, which mm -hmm. I think was probably useful. Yeah, that's um, a very good characterization. I think let's move to the, the, the second of the three dates, which is three months later, and it does connect with this this question of vengeance that I was um, hinting at a little bit earlier where we 
you, you have this very sudden, abrupt return, surprising return of a, a of a monarch, and England has to kind of lurch back into its old ways to some extent with a few modifications. Um, but there's outstanding business, and this is the act really, which is to deal with the past. When when I look at you know this title act of oblivion, I, I feel that we almost need one in this country today after Brexit, and we can all kind of you know start talking to each other once again. Do you want to tell us what the act of oblivion was in 1660? Who des designed it? It doesn't sound like it came directly from the king. It came from others, and. Um, elaborate a little bit more on that yeah. history well as i say charles was not what you would call these days a detail man so i think that he left this the details of it to um hide and uh, I, to... I should add sorry that this is the 29th of august in 1660 yeah. so three months has passed sorry. so yeah so the king comes back on the 29th of may uh, by that time the characters in my novel whaley and goff seeing what's coming have already taken ship and fled as indeed have um, a lot of other regicides. There were 59 signatures of the death warrant of Charles I, of whom 30 or more were still alive. Um, and there were over 100 judges, a lot of whom were still alive. And they realised that things were going to get pretty hot now. Um, so uh, my characters fled about two weeks before Charles actually entered London. Uh, a lot of others fled as well. They went to uh, Holland, Germany, Switzerland, um, or they lay low in the in London or in their estates in the country. Um, the uh, Parliament begins just, just trying to decide what to do about them all. Um, one of the things that happens is there are kind of series of raids of uh, paperwork. Um, of the trial records that were being kept by the clerks of the House of Commons, sometimes not actually within the precincts of, the, of Westminster, but privately. And uh, a man called Prin uh, is central in this, an MP who had been opposed to Charles I, oddly enough, and had been branded on the cheeks and had his ears cut off in the pillory, but then in the peculiar way of fanatics had found himself supporting the royal side and opposed the execution of Charles I. And he was indefatigable. He was a lawyer and a parliamentary committee scoured to get hold of all the paperwork. And eventually they found the records of the King's trial and ultimately, indeed, the death warrant itself. And um, these were the names then that were put out by Parliament who were to be exempted from this act of oblivion. The act of oblivion was, as I say, truth and reconciliation, you know, and it was effective. You know, the Cromwell family, for instance, Richard, who'd succeeded his father, and Henry, the commander in Ireland, both were left alone. Richard, I think, died at a great age, and around 90. Um, so, that, so it worked, except for these people who'd been involved in this, what would have been to that time, an, at that time, an unbelievably violent and sacrilegious act of, of cutting off the head of the king. Um, they were ordered to surrender themselves under the provisions of this act, which, which you know, was promulgated, uh, the bill was promulgated in uh, May and June. And um, quite a lot of them did, several dozen, a couple of dozen, came forward, put their hands up, you, our names are mentioned, we surrender. This proved to be a terrible mistake. They were transferred when they surrendered to the Sergeant at Arms of Parliament. They were then transferred to Lambeth House on the uh, south of the Thames, and um, eventually they were all taken from there to the Tower of London and held in grim conditions, manacled hand and foot, night and day. Um, and um, by that point, the manhunt was underway um, for the others, those that had escaped, um, which is the kind of starting point of my book. And um, uh, so they were pursued. They were picked up. Colonel Jones was picked up walking in Finsbury Park, for example, perfectly openly. Hugh Peters, the radical preacher who really had nothing to do with Charles's death in any legal sense, except whipping up the crowd. He was found hiding in a tavern. Um, uh, 
you know, gradually um, a lot of them were rounded up uh, mm -hmm. and also transferred to the tower. Um, this legislation, um, the number of people who were liable to be picked up, as I said at the beginning, was only four. That became seven, then 12, then 20, and on and on it went. And um, they couldn't really get this bill passed because everyone wanted to put in their little bit of it. Eventually, um, they managed to do it. Um, and Charles went down to, Charles had gone down to Parliament to urge them to finally pass this piece of legislation so that they could clear the decks and get on with running the government. Uh, and on the 29th of August, it did finally pass, a scene that I put in my novel. Um, and at that point, um, it was it was it was ready to go, and the uh, trial of the regicides was set for the autumn. Yeah, and it leads to a quite gruesome section in your book when you describe how um, how these regicides did meet their end a few months later. And um, one last thing, I mean, it, it, on this Parliament passing a law to capture parliamentarians sounds a little bit tangled is that is that the right way to interpret it but you also write early on in the novel about the, the mood of parliament and this seems to me a period of history which is defined by a quite peculiar very charged emotional climate even going back to the death of charles the, the first there's this kind of groan when his head's chopped off that i always remember in the description and then later there's this buoyancy this excitement when charles ii comes back what was the mood of the parliament was it was it in itself quite vengeful over the summer of 1660 yes it was vengeful it was the restoration parliament it was you know they'd elected essentially uh not a puritan parliament and most of those who had been uh, radical um puritan mps were gone um some members of the house of uh, Commons were in fact found themselves um, uh, their names appearing, and that, you know they on on the on the um, rounding roundup list, the wanted list, and they had to slip away. Some of them, not all of them, but they did. Um, Parliament had gone through many kind of versions since um, the start of the Civil War in 1642. The um, when it the the, uh, to a degree, it was a moderate parliament and it wanted to do a deal with the king. The army wouldn't wear that. So the army surrounded parliament uh, in, in 1648. And um, the um, all those who voted in favour of a deal with the king were excluded from it at gunpoint. And uh, the, the parliament which passed the uh, legislation that enabled the execution of the king um, that was they were that was a much smaller, more radical body in tune with the army, um, and then there were successive attempts by Cromwell to come up with a kind of functioning parliament which would both be democratic and do exactly what he wanted. Um, it's a sort of you know, contradiction in terms that he could never quite make it work, and it is a great irony that Cromwell's statue stands outside the parliament to this day, and yet no no one closed it down and tried to dominate it and manipulate it more often than Cromwell did. The, the, part, the mood of the parliament that you had in the summer of 1660 was vengeful, uh, much more so than the king, much more so than Hyde. They wanted to move forward and get on with the business of establishing the royalist regime. And it was parliament that was constantly adding new names to what was essentially a death list. It was an unpleasant parliament, I think. Um, and uh, uh, it was a kind of miracle that the legislation was passed in the form um, that it was, um, but it was, and um, this, this scene was set to move forward, as you say, to, the, to um, Charles I's trial was a show trial, and now there would be the show trial of the men who had tried him. Mm. But let's now talk a little bit about these two figures who are at the heart, along with Naylor, two figures who are at the heart of the novel. Um, because let's go back to the 27th of July, 1660. I think this is a secure date in, in the historical record, and it's one that you open Act of Oblivion with. And it's um, 
it's, it's cinematic, the scene. You have Wally and Goff coming to anchor off Boston, disembarking as fugitives on the run from the new regime in England. Tell me a little bit about these two. We've we've had um, references to them before, but um, can you expand a bit, please? Yes, yeah, sure. When I decided to write the novel, I needed to find um, regicides to write about as well as the regicide hunter. And the two that stood out were Whaley. I, I believe his name is pronounced Whaley because his coat of arms was three spouting whales. Something I wish I spotted earlier in the process as I was constantly finding myself writing lines like, where's Wally? Um, <laughs> which would have been better to have avoided. Anyway, call him Wally or Whaley, but I'm now started to call him Whaley. Edward Whaley was uh, Cromwell's cousin. He was almost exactly the same age, as far as we can work out. They were at Cambridge at more or less the same time. Um, they grew up in the same, therefore together, and I imagine that they must have known one another pretty well. They crop up together in London after Cambridge. Uh, and when Cromwell raises his first regiment, with five troops of cavalry, he gives command of one of the troops to his cousin, Ned. Uh, and we, um, I mean, we know, as far as we know, Whaley had no military training, nor indeed did Cromwell, but they managed to forge an extraordinary um, troop of cavalry, which became known as the Ironsides. Um, Whaley was a kind of failed uh, farmer, uh, um, failed uh, draper, um, one of those English families that had fallen on hard times is they'd been rich in the past and now weren't. He was sort of discontented. Um, he was politically moderate. Uh, you know, he wore quite fine clothes. Later, he opposed Cromwell's expedition to Ireland. He was very, very close to his cousin, though he lived next door to him in King Street in Whitehall and seems effectively to have been in charge of his personal security um, when he was protector. Uh, so uh, that was Whaley. Uh, Goff, his son-in-law, who arrived with him in New England to escape vengeance, uh, he was a quite different kind of character. He was about 40 years old. He was a, um, um, a radical preacher in the parliamentary army, not an ordained priest, but a uh, one of those guys who got up and described the visions that God had sent him, and which were universally hostile to uh, the king. He spoke, he was a prominent speaker at the Putney debates, and even had the temerity to criticise Cromwell. And these two men represent really the two kind of wings of the army, the two competing forces. And it's interesting that Cromwell was friends with both of them. Um, what Goff thought what, uh, what Whaley thought of having Goff as a son-in-law, I don't know. But he see, they do seem to have got on pretty well. And this ill-assorted duo, um, Goff having left behind five children, the youngest a baby he'd never even uh, seen, uh, having struggled against the betrayal of Monk, when that failed, they boarded ship. They turned up in New England on the 27th of July. We can be certain of the date because Goff kept a diary. They moored off Boston. They went then into the town. They saw the governor, John Endicott, uh, who was delighted to welcome. These were the two most senior figures who had ever visited um, New England or America generally. They were both colonels, both key figures in the regime that had just come to an end. But of course, nobody knew that it had permanently come to an end. I'm sure Whaley and Goff thought they were only temporarily hiding out in America, and soon they'd be sailing back in triumph, because God, who'd raised their course so high and made it so triumphant, would surely make it possible for them to return. He wouldn't allow the godly to continue to triumph. They went to stay with a, at the house of a fellow passenger, Daniel Gookin, um, who had been for two years working for Cromwell in London. Uh, and had now returned to his home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, just in the shadow of the newly built Harvard College. And there for the first um, six months or so, uh, Whaley and Goff lived perfectly openly with the Gookin family until the warrant arrived from London for their arrest. And at that point, it became very dangerous for them to be seen anywhere in public. And that's when the chase, which is the heart of my novel, begins. They have to flee. They have to get out, really, in midwinter. 
from Cambridge and get to a safer territory away from Massachusetts. What what materials did you have to animate their lives? Because we're talking at quite a distant historical period. They were um, traveling around, so they wouldn't be in a settled position to keep documents in any ordered way you'd imagine. Yet it seems that you're talking about a journal. So could you tell us a little bit about how you went about um, bringing these characters back to life? Well, I read every single thing I could about them, and I even made a couple of discoveries about them simply because no one else had paid them that this this much specific attention, I think. Um, and uh, so they they um, we know details of their movements because Goff did keep a journal, most of which uh, was lost in a fire. Um, more than 100 years after his death. But the um, we know uh, quite a bit of it was copied out, and so we know where he was when, more or less. And there were letters from others around them and letters from his wife to him and from uh, various Puritan clergymen in uh, England, one in particular who was the brother-in-law of um, Colonel Whaley, uh, Hook, um, so we can be pretty sure about a lot of their movements, and uh, they leave um, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. They travel across country, across what was known as the old Connecticut path through the winter, probably on foot, actually, rather than on horseback, um, 160 miles, um, until eventually they, uh, they reach Hartford in Connecticut. Then they go south to the coast to New Haven, which is... Uh, the scene of a very, very radical Puritan group who believed that Christ would return to earth in New Haven itself. They stay there. And then at around not long after they arrived there, um, the warrant arrives from London, really specifically addressed to the governors of New England, who, because in London, they're suspecting that they're shielding these um, uh, fugitives, which indeed they were, and now an armed group goes out in pursuit of them, to which I attach Mr. Naylor, my fictional character, and they have to leave New Haven. And so the adventures go on, and we know more or less where they were and who sheltered them. And then I came along, I come along as a novelist and supply the detail of what it must have been like mm. to live this life on the run in barns and attics and cellars and out in the open sometimes for months at a time, you know, living by what you can catch and trap in the woods and in the streams. Um, and that really is the heart of the book and really what one can bring as a novelist that is worthwhile to history is this empathy with characters. Yeah. Although they're not easily, yeah. not easy to sympathise with two Puritan colonels who've organised the murder of the king, um, nevertheless, I sort of do, and I hope that in time the reader does as well. Yeah, but you've got these two wonderful and very different historical contexts that you've managed to bring together into the same narrative. There's, of course, England with its political turmoil in 1660, but then there's the, the broad expanse of America, early colonial history, the the, the almost frontier vibe that's, uh, that, that, that's there. One last question, though, on... Um, on Goff, I think. And I was thinking in writing about the interior, the rich spiritual interior world of a character like him, um, did it help? I mean, you have to have a good grasp of, of scripture to get to understand these characters. I was wondering whether your previous writing on um, a book like Conclave helped in that sense, writing about people who were not just vivid in the physical world, but people who had um, very rich internal spiritual lives. Yes, I think that uh, Conclave helped me and also a book that I did in, w in which the, the, it's set far in the future in which the church has become all dominant again. And the book, the book of Revelation, uh, is what they use to explain the cal calamity which has destroyed modern civilization. And uh, the book of Revelation features strongly in the latter part of parts of this book because one of the ways in which um, they were able to keep going was the belief that brighter times lay around the corner. In particular, that in 1666, it had a numerical sim symbolism because of the the so-called number of the beast in um, in the uh, 
uh, in the book of Revelation that the um, that Christ would return to earth in that year and there would be the kingdom of the saints and that uh, the righteous would rise and take power and that the king and all his ministers would be swept away. And this really does seem to have kept them going. Um, and I knew this would be, so this, this is, becomes a kind of point of friction between the pragmatic Ned and the mystical will. And of course, in 1665, you have the plague, which wiped out a quarter of the population of London, about 100,000 people, followed by the Great Fire of London in 1666. And you had a comet, had his comet in the sky. You had uh, the war with the Dutch, which went very badly. And it seemed like the four horsemen of the apocalypse had indeed arrived. So this gave me a kind of framework that is both spiritual and practical. And also, let's face it, that we live in a superstitious age. We live in an age where quite a few people still do believe in the rapture and that Christ will come to earth again, and all other sorts of religious fundamentalism of various faiths to do with the facing of icons and suppression of music and theatre. You know, it's not hard, really, to think oneself into the mind of a soldier who uh, has these kind of beliefs. But at any rate, the trick is not so much that as to make them sympathetic. And the thing that is sympathetic about William Goff is his deep and abiding love for his wife and children left behind, expressed through letters, and his tender care of his father-in-law as his father-in-law gets older and more infirm. And his bravery in an extraordinary scene towards the end of the novel, which seems to be true historically, that he actually had to come out of hiding to protect the town where he was um, living from a, an attack by the Native Americans, the Indians in the Indian War of 1675. So, you know, I hope that I've managed to make them credible and, and made them authentic in their beliefs and yet at the same time accessible to us. All this and the heart of it is, you know, a story of a pursuit as well. So, so much to drive you forward through it. Last question before I release you back into 2022, at least, is if you could um, have a tangible memento from the year 1660, something which maybe is emblematic of the story or which you would just like to have. Is there anything you'd like to choose? Well, I think the obvious thing is, and it does exist, um, and of course it should remain where it is rather than in my study, and that is the death warrant of Charles I, because the first scene in my novel is the regicides arriving yeah. in New England. The second is also a true story of around that date, which was the man who commanded the troops at King Charles I's execution Colonel Hacker, unbelievably hung on, on to the death warrant, which he was given by Cromwell personally. You know, here's the order, and here's everyone who's given you authority to uh, organise this event. Anyway, he kept it in his country house in Statham in uh, Leicestershire. And when he disclosed, when he was uh, interrogated in the tower, that he still had this thing, uh, the House of Lords ordered that his wife should be ordered to go to the country house find the warrant and return with it to London immediately. And, and it says in the, in, in, the, in the official document, a man was sent with her for this purpose. And I, this is my nail. Oh, this is his first appearance. Yeah. So he goes up, they open a safe. She gives him the warrant. It's nine inch, eight or nine inches wide, and it unrolls to 17 inches. And there are all these names, uh, Bradshaw, Gray, uh, and Cromwell is the four, uh, third or fourth to sign, and directly underneath his name is that of Whaley, and 14th to sign is Goff, and this is their death warrant as well. And um, it is the most extraordinary document. It is still the property of the House of Lords, and it forms the end papers of my book, and that I would have loved to have um, held, at least, before I gave it back. What a thought. What an extraordinary document. What a fascinating period of history. Robert Harris, this has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Book is wonderful as ever, and uh, I hope you have more fun talking um, about it yet. Thank you very much for coming on Travels Through Time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Robert Harris the other day about this book, which I'm going to show you one more time. Act of Oblivion. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you did, please subscribe to our feed. We'll try and bring as many of these video conversations to you as we can over the next few months.
as we keep going on our travels through time. Goodbye.